technology. Okay, uh, hi everyone, I'm Florian. I'll be talking about uh, gas token, which is a ERC20 token that we launched on the Ethereum uh, network. And sort of more broadly, the general picture here will be about how to think about pricing and exchanging um, sort of fundamental resources and commodities in blockchains. Um, sort of seeing this title, you, you might sort of wonder, well, whoa, yet another token. Uh, even the academics are now getting into this. And um, I'm just going to say, well, why should we not get to be part of the fun and make stupid logos for our tokens? Um, sort of more, more seriously, you'll actually realize, I hope I can convince you of this, that a gas token is actually somewhat different from most or from a large number of uh, ERC-20 tokens you might be familiar with in Ethereum in that um, what we're doing here actually really fundamentally can't be done without a token in that the gas token isn't actually, um, we're not selling any resource, there's not going to be any ICO, unfortunately, um, but the, the resource that gas token sort of encodes um, but fundamentally can't be exchanged directly for Ether, and that's sort of why we were introducing this, uh, this token. Anyway, so first of all, um, I sort of start with a, maybe a, a bit of a grim picture. Um, so imagine that tomorrow you're gonna go buy your coffee, as always, it'll cost four dollars, I mean it's Boston, um, and well, you're gonna pay a transaction fee of say 10 cents with your credit card. Um, then you're coming back at the end of the week on Friday and well, you're going to pay the same amount for, for the same coffee, but suddenly you're actually going to pay six dollars, uh, more than six dollars in transaction fees. You're probably not going to be extremely happy. It's kind of an expensive coffee at that point. Um, it turns out that in cryptocurrencies, uh, that's actually what transaction fees look like. They're extremely volatile. So this shows in Ethereum the sort of average mining reward in the blocks so is kind of directly correlated to the transaction fees. And over time, this just goes, goes like, I guess it's a factor of roughly, I think, 40x or 50x that it can vary. Um, and um, one, one particular thing that actually sort of caused one of these huge spikes was uh, the CryptoKitty sort of craze uh, a few months ago. And this, this isn't just something that happens in Ethereum, so other cryptocurrencies like uh, Bitcoin will actually surprisingly have a um, transaction fee graph that very, the, they all very closely mirror each other between um, currencies. And so there's just this big volatility problem that there's very big differences in offer and demand for um, transactions and the network just can't really handle this volatility. So we might then wonder, well, how, how do we usually deal with this? I mean, there's, there's other things out there, um, any kind of resource or commodity actually where the offer and demand vary a lot there over time. They're also very um, volatile, and yet the prices can stay relatively stable. Um, and the way this is usually done is actually by just stocking up things when prices are low, which is sort of a, a speculation on the fact that prices will go back up. Um, this can be directly encoded in certain financial instruments like futures and other derivatives on, on commodities or their prices. Um, but this is somewhat awkward in, a, in this cryptocurrency setting. Like, how, how do you speculate on transaction fees? You can't really stockpile a transaction fee or, say, gas in Ethereum. Um, well, it turns out that actually in a sort of very twisted way, you can. Um, and this is what gas token does for you. So this is a token that actually allows you to stockpile and then trade Ethereum gas between users and sort of indirectly thus creating a market for transaction fees and sort of uh, an easy way to also get futures or other derivatives out of it. Um, this is a project, a sort of small project that we started uh, last summer with uh, Ari Jules, who you might have heard uh, give a really cool talk uh, about an hour ago, and uh, Phil Dyan and uh, Lawrence Breidenbach. And this is sort of part of a more general sort of research agenda uh, that I'll get back to um, later in this talk. So just so we're on the same page, so before I, I introduce what gas token does, um, let's just have a quick primer on how gas works in Ethereum, if you're not familiar with the underlying mechanism. 
So Ethereum is a smart contract cryptocurrency. So say you have this simple contract. It doesn't do anything particularly interesting. It takes a number, does some arithmetic, takes some hash, stores it in long-term storage. And the Ethereum platform sort of just decided that these various operations have a specific cost associated with them for, for miners and sort of for the network in general. And this would look something a bit roughly like this. So arithmetic is extremely cheap. And the, the unit that Ethereum uses for this is gas. So one gas is sort of one atomic unit of computation. And so arithmetic is basically three units. You have to like load two words, add them together. Um, something like a hash is considered to cost about 30 units of computation. And storing something in long-term storage is considered to be very expensive because it sort of takes a toll on the, on the whole network. Like all the miners then actually have to store these values over time. So this is a much more expensive operation. And then all these gas costs combined just sort of give you the gas cost of the contract. And this is, this is fixed over time. Like every time this contract is run, it's going to cost 20,000 free gas, roughly. Um, but then, of course, the the actual transaction fee that is not measured in gas but in ether can vary over time. And so the way this works is that, say you have a user who actually wants to run a transaction, so he'll broadcast to the miners that, hey, I want to run this function on input one. And well, as any miner will do, they're just going to ask, well, how much are you willing to pay for this? Why should we care? And the user might sort of specify a gas price, which in, in Ethereum, this is usually reported in giga way. So way is the sort of smallest fundamental uh, unit of Ether. It's sort of the equivalent of the Satoshi in Bitcoin. So one giga way is just one billion way. And then one Ether would be another billion on top. So one billion billion way. Um, and Gas prices in, this, in the range of gigaways or tens of gigaways are relatively standard. So here the user might just say, well, I'm going to pay one gigaway per unit of gas. So 20,033 gigaway in total. That's about two hundredths of a cent of ether. And the miners might just say, nah, I mean, that's not very interesting. Um, we have other transactions out there that pay more, so we're not going to include your transaction right now. OK, so the user might say, well, OK, fine, I'll pay you 10 gigaway per unit of gas, so like a 10 times more ether. And then the miners might be like, OK, that's fine. That's a reasonable price. So this is kind of how ga the gas ecosystem works. Um, so let's now look at gas token in a nutshell, what it does. So a fundamental property of the Ethereum virtual machine right now is that, as I said before, it's charges relatively high gas costs for operations that alter the blockchain state. Things like storing um, values in a, in a contract's long-term storage. But then Ethereum also wants to incentivize users to clean up after themselves. Say if you're, there's a contract that you don't need anymore, or there's some storage that this contract was using that is not, no longer needed, there's really no point of keeping it on the chain forever. So Ethereum wants to provide some positive incentive for users to clean this up. And so when you actually clean up storage in a contract, the transaction in which this happens will sort of get a gas refund. So you'll end up paying less gas if you're sort of a nice citizen and clean up after yourself. And this actually leads to a very simple sort of gas arbitrage mechanism that had the, the idea had been sort of floating around for a while since I think in 2015 that uh, Vitalik Buterin mentioned uh, that something like this could be done by, by miners, actually. Well, the, the idea is very simple, is that when gas prices are low, when sort of no one's really making much use of the network, we're just going to write a bunch of stuff to storage, um, not, any, not even anything useful. And then when gas prices are high, because you're, everyone's uh, mining or breeding uh, crypto kitties, and you also want to do this, but you don't want to pay a lot of money, or you're just going to clear all this storage and make use of this refund um, to pay for this much higher transaction fee that you're having because the, the transaction fee prices just went through the roof. And the, what gas token actually brings sort of on top of the, this sort of general arbitrage idea that uh, people had already been talking about for a while is that um, it really sort of democratizes the whole process and makes it into a, an open market where essentially the, these slots of storage that people 
that maybe I am writing to a contract, I don't necessarily have to be the consumer later on of, uh, that actually benefits from this refund. So I can just take these slots of storage and sell them to someone else as a regular token because they might be interested in getting a refund on their transaction. Let me walk you through a, a simple example that might sort of show a bit better what's going on. Um, so say it's sort of the, the height of the crypto kitty hype and gas prices are relatively high, so 40 gig away, that was kind of standard at that time. And you're just interested in breeding some new crypto kitty. Um, this part of the smart contract for crypto kitties is actually quite expensive. Um, so let's say it costs about 250,000 gas to breed a new, a new kitten. And at these gas prices, it's actually going to cost you like $9 just in, in transaction fees to get your new crypto kitty. That's kind of unfortunate. Um, uh, let's say sometime in the past, maybe before crypto kitties came out, um, gas prices were actually quite low. They've also dropped a lot since then. And now a gas price of one gig away, it was very standard back then. It's also gotten more standard now. Um, say at that time, the usage of the network was maybe a bit lower. So you're saying, OK, I'm going to use gas token and just store a bunch of words, um, store a bunch of things in, in this contract storage. So this is actually also going to cost a lot of gas, uh, around 20,000 or so maybe. But because the gas price is so low right now, well, this is actually going to incur a very, very small fee of maybe 20 cents. Now we come back to our um, CryptoKitty transaction. Again, the gas price went through the roof. It's at 40 gig away. But now instead of just doing a transaction that breeds your kitties, you're sort of going to bundle it um, with another call to gas token that just sort of tells it, well, free 10 of my storage words. So now, all of a sudden, you get this huge gas refund in this same transaction. And because the gas prices are so high, this actually translates into, a, into sort of a nice saving of like close to half of the transaction fee you had. And as I said before, the, the person who's actually sort of doing this first transaction, the, the sort of storing or stockpiling of resources, doesn't have to be the same person who then later on wants to use this stockpiled gas to actually get refunds. So you can just sort of trade these storage slots, uh, like the way people trade stored lumber or whatever other commodity in the real world. The, one of the caveats of how the refund mechanism in Ethereum works is that there's an upper limit on how much refund you can use in any given transaction. And so you can never actually use refunds to pay for more than half of what the transaction would have cost. So you could never get this price of $9 down to sort of less than four and a half dollars uh, using, using these refund techniques. A bit more details for those who are interested. Um, where, there's actually two variants of gas token that we deployed that we call just simply GST1 and GST2. One of them um, uses just sort of standard token storage. Uh, more specifically, this is the S store instruction in, uh, in the EVM. So all it does is that it, it stores a bunch of ones. This is uh, expensive operations because then these ones have to be stored by every miner. And then later on, it just replaces these by zeros and you get a refund. Um, it turns out that you can also do this with smart contract creation in general in that when you completely remove a smart contract from the blockchain, um, Ethereum also gives you a refund, again, to sort of incentivize useless contracts to be removed from the chain. Um, it turns out that the second variant is a little bit more complex to set up, but it's also a little bit more efficient in that um, with gas storage, um, with, uh, sorry, with the state storage of a contract, you pay about 20,000 gas to write to storage, and then you can get a uh, 10,000 refund when you erase it. So it's sort of Ultimately, there's some kind of 50% efficiency that, uh, that you can get from this. And with contract creation and deletion, the refund is actually slightly higher than half the price you paid. Uh, so sort of as numbers get big, uh, you can actually get slightly more efficient gas token variant by sort of just creating a whole bunch of contracts and then removing them from, from chain later on. Um, and so more generally, it's actually as soon as the volatility between sort of low and high gas prices is over a factor of about 2x, um, 
you can actually use this refund mechanism in, uh, in an efficient way. Um, this is a, a plot uh, we have of kind of how efficient these, these things are really in practice. So on the, on the x-axis, you have just the, the volatility between high and low gas prices all the way up to, say, 40, which is kind of standard in the, in the network, as we've seen. Um, and on the y-axis, you just have the, the sort of savings or efficiency of the contract. So um, in order to actually start saving anything, um, just to get back to sort of parity, as I said, you need a volatility of about a factor 2x. And then there's a very, very small range where actually writing to storage is more efficient than creating contracts and deleting those. But then as soon as the volatility is high enough, I think it's more than a factor, say, three or so, um, actually creating and deleting contracts is a, is a very, very efficient way of making use of these uh, gas refunds. I'm going to just go through some of the sort of general questions people have in, uh, about this token, sort of things uh, people often ask us about um, when they first heard about this idea. Um, so you may wonder, like, who, who actually pays for this refund in the network? Uh, it's kind of like, why, why is your transaction suddenly cheaper? Um, it turns out that technically this is actually the miner who will mine it, because he'll just mine a transaction that costs, say, 250,000 gas, but in the end he's only actually paid for, say, 150,000 gas, because uh, the rest is considered a refund. Um, so then, of course, the obvious follow-up question is, well, wh why would miners even bother? Why would they not just blacklist any transaction that makes use of gas token? Um, and this is, a, this is a super interesting question, actually. And uh, there's, there's a few ways of, of uh, thinking about this. One is that, actually, in some sense, Ethereum has this really nice property that is somewhat naturally censorship resistant in that for a miner to actually try to, to check whether a transaction is using gas token or not, well, he kind of has to run it in the first place. And then, well, he might as well include it in a block and get paid for all the work he already did. Um, of course, there's a lot of things miners could do, maybe some kind of smart static analysis of transactions to very quickly check if the transaction is going to be worth it or not. But this is actually something we really haven't seen yet in, in Ethereum, and it would actually be very, very interesting to see how this unfolds. Um, it was more generally speaking about how, how bad this could be for the network. Um, we've, we've disclosed this to the Ethereum Foundation about six months ago. They didn't seem too concerned about the long-term effects. But we're very, very interested in sort of seeing the, um, the incentives that are, are going to be at, um, at play here. Sort of whether users will start using gas token um, or not, what, how closely the price will reflect the actual gas price and so on. Um, and just sort of a, a disclaimer, um, this is not, uh, we're not selling anything. Um, we're actually probably going to be talking very closely with people from the Ethereum Foundation about how to get rid of these issues, um, sort of why, what, sort of the, the problems in, the, in Ethereum that actually make it possible to even do something like gas token. So don't, don't really expect anything from us. Um, but I mean, if you, if you are interested, the tokens are live. Uh, we have a, a website where you can learn a bit more about how these things work. Um, you'll notice that actually one of, our, one of our contracts has this nice property that it has a very special address that starts with a whole bunch of zeros. Um, this is actually, I think this is the most expensive uh, address ever computed in, in Ethereum. And you can read on our website a bit more about why we did this and uh, how expensive it actually was. Um, so let me just go very quickly through what the issue actually is in this space. Um, so why, why this works. Um, this is kind of the big issue with, with storage pricing. Um, and so the problem here is that when you write to the blockchain state, well, it's kind of permanent. That's kind of the idea of blockchains. They're immutable. Things stay there over time. Um, and the issue here is that you basically have a one-time transaction. So you pay one transaction fee. Um, but then you have a recurring and indefinite cost to the network and to the miners. Um, and yet you, you want writing to state to, um, to be expensive because otherwise you get sort of trivial DOS attacks where people just spam the network with, uh, with a lot of expensive operations. But it's not necessarily clear like what the right price should be for this. Um, 
And then, as I said, you also kind of want incentives uh, for users to clean up because otherwise you just get a big bloat in the network. And there's actually there's some analysis that shows that there's some transactions in Bitcoin's UTXO set where there's really no positive incentive to actually remove these transactions because it will cost more in transaction fees to actually spend these coins than they're actually worth. Um, and so in, in Ethereum, there's some proposals on how you might do this in a smarter way. Um, the sort of general idea is to charge rent for contract storage, um, which would mean that sort of you're, you're paying for storage not only at a single point in time, but over time. And if you stop paying for the storage, it just gets destroyed. And so in that case, you wouldn't really need this refund mechanism anymore. But it's kind of tricky to get these things right. Um, it's kind of now all of a sudden as a developer of a smart contract, you have to think of like all the possible ways in which part of your storage might get deleted because rent wasn't paid. Um, and this also doesn't really work for the UTXO set, for instance, because there you really don't want things to just disappear. Um, so as I promised, there's a, there's a sort of bigger picture here, uh, which we also, we have a, a website up that uh, talks about this uh, in a bit more detail, um, which is sort of just thinking about what we call crypto commodities, which are sort of raw um, resources or, or yeah, commodities that, that are used in blockchain transactions, such as uh, memory, like the block space and the computation. Um, and this sort of the general question of how do we actually accurately price and yet allow to freely trade um, these commodities. Uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip this, this part. You can read a bit more um, on, our, on our Project Chicago website about some other ideas we have in this space for futures on gas transactions that are more efficient and so on. And uh, yeah, um, you can go to these two websites to learn a bit more about this project, about the ideas we have in this space. And I'm very happy to chat um, offline if you have any further questions. Thank you.